Okay, well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to another Tuesday night at SAMA. I'm David Rubin, the Brown Foundation Curator of Contemporary Art here, and it's my pleasure uh, to welcome you to this evening's artist panel, featuring five of the artists who are in the psychedelic exhibition. Uh, before we begin, if you have not already done so, please turn off your cell phone. Um, I also want to acknowledge the sponsor of tonight's panel, the Mary Cargill Lecture Series Endowment. We're grateful to the Cargill family for their ongoing support of our programs. And I also want to once again uh, thank the, the sponsors of the Psychedelic Exhibition, Sama Contemporaries, Jerry Gore, and the Toby Devin Lewis Philanthropic Fund of the Community Federation of Cleveland. Also, a couple of upcoming events to remind you of. July will be as exciting as ever here at SAMA. On July 6th, we're going to be reviving the July Artist Conversations, which began as a part of Contemporary Art Month, which has since moved to uh, March. But we've decided to continue the conversations in July. And we will have two artist conversations uh, this July. The first will be on July 6th. And uh, these will be with artists represented in the SAMA collection. And July 6th will be a conversation with Susan Budge. And on July 20th will be a conversation with Angel Rodriguez Diaz. I hope you'll join us for that. And on July 13th, we'll have another film as part of the uh, psychedelic programming, and that will be the psychedelic classic Ken Russell's film of The Who's rock opera, Tommy. So I hope you'll join us for those activities. Now, let me tell you a little bit about the format that we're going to use this evening. Um, we have uh, five artists, and we're going to look at each of their work uh, over their career individually. I will invite each artist up to join me here at the podium alphabetically. We're going to try to keep the, the presentation seg segments to about 10 to 12 minutes. And then uh, when we finish that, uh, they'll take their seats um, up on the stage here. Uh, I have a few questions that I've prepared for them, and then we'll open it up to questions from all of you. So um, let's, uh, let me first introduce the first artist, and then we'll dim the lights. Our first artist is George Cisneros. A sound and technology artist, George has been exploring combinations of primitive and digital technologies to generate works exploring community memory and perception. He attended the University of Texas at Austin for percussion studies and electronic composition. At the University of Buffalo, he studied with John Cage, Morton Feldman, and Earl Brown. He received a BM in music studies from the University of Houston. In 1987, George received an MM in electronic imaging and sound from the Ohio State University. And he founded Urban 15 Group in 1975 as a collective of 15 environmental and conceptual artists interested in using the cityscape as a canvas. And of course, their programming is ongoing. So won't you join me in welcoming George Cisneros. Hey, George. Uh, no, up right here. We're going to look at this together. Uh, can we dim the lights? Great. Mm -hmm. So uh, let's. This is actually the earliest work uh, in our. You can see it on here. Oh. Okay, and they'll see it on there. So. Let me. Let me. <laughs> <laughs> so George, this is of course Cascades of Jubilation, uh, represented in psychedelic. Tell us a little bit about this piece briefly. What inspired it? How does it work? And how has it sort of changed over the years? Um. Okay. Uh, Just speak into here. Okay, great. Uh, it is a montage piece in the sense that uh, it's a collection of many, many, many old works. And um, uh, most of them go back to the late 70s, uh, living in Houston. And uh, uh, the pieces themselves are, are using some pretty primitive toys. Uh, a lot of video feedback, uh, Commodore 64s, <laughs> Amiga 500s, uh, Apple IIs. And uh, uh, that was really about most of the technology that was available to, in 78 through uh, oh, early, early 80s. Uh, but uh, the piece itself is, uh, is trying to push the extremes of colors uh, that were available to us in the, in the digital or in the, in the analog video world at that time. And so the whole piece is really pushing the limits of uh, the analog systems. and, and uh, 
it was this cascades of jubilation comes from uh, just the the sense of bliss rather than the chaos that uh, uh, I was uh, trying to deal with. How did how did you create the actual light show on? Because you first recorded it onto videotape. Is that correct? Well, these are the uh, video the old three quarter inch videotapes made in the seventies and eighties that we were able to locate and then uh, dump them over to uh, uh, you know uh, After Effects and, and Final Cut to uh, you know put them into a digital format so we could screen them. But this is what they looked like back then. Uh, I'm surprised the image hasn't degraded as much as it could have. Uh, I did find the original tapes and uh, of the soundtracks and we. Uh, Again, remaster those and, and join them together. It was it was quite a, a, a you might say forensic uh, technology project to put. And, and what was your inspiration for making the piece in the first place? I don't work on inspiration. <laughs> it comes well, out. Why of did you, Why did you make it? So what was the process? <laughs> was the what process it, what was, was the process it came out of? Well, the process, uh, you know, is it was that psychedelic era and the whole uh, uh, McLuhan-esque world that we were living in at that time. And the uh, the bliss factor was uh, kind of brought in by the fact that I have a I've epilepsy, and uh, those two and three days after major seizures were were just pretty deep in terms of uh, the abyss and nothing. And so much of this piece is about the micro, micro, micro level of who you are. There's a lot of DNA in here. There's a lot of uh, kind of chromosomal. Uh, anarchy going on inside uh, during during epilepsy so uh, so uh, do you had yeah. hallucinations similar to some of the imagery in this piece that's the way I see most of the time okay David, <laughs> <laughs> you have such great color <laughs> okay no so I mean that's the way I hear too I mean there are t times when mm -hmm. I hear that sound that and sound is of course as important as visual image to you in your work uh, they're one and the same because they're, they're just different that. frequencies yeah. 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 It's just different frequencies. Okay. Let's okay. let's talk about this work, which okay. apparently was at the San Antonio Museum of Art. Okay. In this 1981. is an early sound installation, 1981. Um, and what we did is we it, that's the roof of the building, and this is the we view. Have this image this also. Is, no, go back one. Go back one. Okay. This is what the audience saw in 1981 when you were in this very room. You saw the slide on the left, and that image was either through a little camera on the roof of this building, or and every now and then a slide. But that structure was on the roof of what is now the, the uh, what is that building called now? The way the Contemporary Arts Museum, Contemporary Art Wing is. The one right there. What the Cowden Gallery? Oh, Cowden. Okay. Okay, yeah. okay, it was where the pigeons lived uh, back then. Uh, you go back, go to the next slide, and you'll see the holes in the roof where the pigeons were getting into that building. Uh, it was very dangerous to work on that roof. Uh, I did fall through once. Uh, one lake. And, and what and was the piece about exactly? The piece were nine resonators that were put on the roof of the building. <clears throat> and there was a microphone in each resonator. And in that black box was a little switcher that could turn different microphones off and on. But the microphones themselves were listening to the freeway. And so at each resonator is a different pitch. You only heard the sounds of the traffic resonant to that particular pitch. Hence the title, Traffic Flux. Traffic Flux. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, that piece toured around the country. And it was a, it was a pretty good uh, live in sound installation piece with video. And in 81, not many of us were uh, toying with those kind of elements. It was fun. Uh, oh, yeah. It kind of same period. I totally, headphones are really important to me. But anyway, this is what I call a site-specific sculptural intervention that uh, 1981, I'm not going to tell you where exactly it was done. I could be arrested. So uh, <laughs> by an international uh, relationship there. And, and what's, well, what was happening? It was just the headphones, or was there a sound component? Oh, no. This was had to be done very quickly, taking a picture and get out. OK. OK. So it was a, a true intervention. Uh, All right. Now, how okay. about these headphones? Oh, these headphones were, uh, uh, these are uh, 22 by, oh, you took the titles off. No, I took the dimensions off. The dimensions off. Okay, this is a 22 by 8 by something. And it was an interactive piece that used heat uh, body sensors. You walked inside of it, and it would turn on. Uh, this was, uh, uh, I did probably about 10 or 15 of these large uh, headphones. One of them ended up here at the museum in 1994, and it was suspended in the Cowden Gallery. Uh, this is uh, was part of the... Uh, faculty show at the Art Institute in 90. Again, 
uh, I used uh, uh, some touch pads underneath the carpet. So when people walked into the circle, the little blue components in there were actually hidden loudspeakers. And there was motorized seed pod uh, uh, apparatus that created these nice little textures. But it was, again, exploring interactive. What we now uh, see is participatory art, which seems to be becoming much more prevalent today. Uh, I guess, yeah, I guess participatory, and yeah, that's a good <laughs> way. OK, this was uh, in Killeen. Uh, it was a memorial to the, uh, um, that was done in Dia de los Muertos in 1994. It was a memorial for the Luby's uh, uh, victims of the shootout. And it was done at a, a college up there. And uh, this, I, I was started exploring making video altars in the 80s. Uh, my grandmother was a papel picado artist, and she did the altars in our family. And so I kind of naturally uh, uh, moved into doing my altars in video. First video was, uh, uh, I guess, October 86. Somewhere in there was when, and, uh, and since then, I've gone the full gamut of desktops to mainframes to supercomputers, and now I'm back to uh, uh, desktops. Uh, doing the the Dia de los Muertos uh, pieces. And what's the imagery on the monitors? Well, uh, it's the whole calaveras and the, uh, a lot of the Orozco uh, imagery and a lot of, of uh, digital work. Candles, you'll know some candles, but it, this is all animated. Uh, in the old days, you would have to have multiple VHS players running. Mm. Uh, now you can do it off the hard drives mm. and with multiple video cards. Mm. Uh, again, back in that same period, uh, uh, kind of a found art, uh, uh, doing a lot of studies of, of Mayan glyphs and realized that uh, uh, that could have been a scene from My Love Lucy. So adding the rabbit ears uh, it made a lot of sense, the whole old world, new world technology number. Uh, that was a, the, the, sound, the video installation in front of the uh, uh, International Center. It still exists, but the... Uh, after the first three years when my contract ended for maintaining it, the city decided not to uh, spend any money on maintenance. So the 26 uh, uh, monitors are slowly dying. Uh, we're right now trying to find a way to uh, have those 26 monitors replaced. But it ran flawlessly for seven years. Uh, and then um, it, 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 it's, it's still there. It's, it was, it was and, a nice and what piece. And what do we see on the monitors? I mean, does the imagery change as we watch it? Oh, yeah, there's 141 minutes of, 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 of uh, looping data. And this was a piece about international trade. And what we did was, uh, uh, you see there that orange, the orange piece there? Mm -hmm, the That's center. one of the oldest pieces of money ever, uh, ever made in the New World. And it was, uh, it was from, uh, they, they minted it in Zacatecas. It went to uh, Veracruz, was on its way to Spain when uh, uh, English uh, pirates, state-supported artists from, uh, uh, artists, or pirates, yeah, I guess that's what it is. They supported terrorism. Uh, the English took the money from the Spanish galleons and ended back in London. And that piece of stone was found, a uh, piece of silver was actually found at Fort Knox, uh, where the British, uh, well, they sent silver to the New World. All the Spanish silver was sent to the New World. Uh, and anyway, during World War II, when they were afraid of the war, they moved all the treasury from Washington, D.C. to Fort Knox and discovered chests of Spanish silver mm. that had financed the American Revolution. You know, I mean, it's just so incredible, this money stuff. And the whole mural is about So you obviously currency. did a lot yeah. of research into yeah, different spent currencies. About, we spent about two years doing research, okay. mainly in uh, the different mints and the different uh, collections around uh, in Canada, United States, and Mexico. My, lots of my work has to do with memory. And sometimes money is the greatest study of what a national memory is all about. Mm -hmm. And during this time, we probably scanned uh, hundreds and hundreds of bills and pieces of currency from the early uh, co uh, 13 colonies and then the New World. And nowhere did we ever find a Christian image on any of the money. It was all mm -hmm. Roman. It was all Masonic. Mm -hmm. And so when they come and claim this, you know, that the, the Christian uh, nature of the of 13 American colonies, uh-uh, man, look at what they were worshiping when you just look at those old bills. The symbols on them are pretty incredible. They're very, very uh, iconographic about what their genetic memory was, hmm. the founding fathers, and they were not. Okay, uh, 
Again, I like digital because it's silicon. Well, silica is is part of sand, and so uh, I've and whenever I've needed you know stuff, I do, I go back to concrete as a as a way of, of kind of uh, getting some foundation. This is a piece that was uh, for Peter Holt's uh, boardroom. And the frames are made out of the radiators of, of certain uh, caterpillars. And uh, the parts are uh, parts of the early 1904, 1914, 1920s uh, uh, caterpillar tractors. Uh, there's some wrenches there mm. in the center part and those wrenches are actually the wrenches used by Peter Holt's grandfather mm -hmm. during the time when he was making the thing that eventually gets patented, the, t the treads. So this, the, is, this is really, in a way, about the heritage of, of the, the whole family of the and patron all the, of the work. The patron yes. of the work. Yeah. It was a commission mm -hmm. work. Mm -hmm. uh, there's another one. That was done for the Spurs, and that was a 2002. That's 31 by 7 by 14 feet. It's like 104 feet of neon, and then it's got about 1,400 LEDs as the as the rowel. But rather than making a pico rowel, you know, like most spurs, we decided to do a molecule, and uh, an atom rather, and that's why we call it the atomic spur. It's still up there at at at, at the uh, SBC Center, AT and T Center, whatever they call it now. Oh, uh, this is a, a, a collaborative Catherine and I did uh, for Blue Star on uh, Commerce Street. And uh, the fact that we were working like with Digital World is very ephemeral. We work a lot with cloth and sound. This was a, a very, this was, this was a great piece. I loved it. It's one of the best ones we ever worked on together with just the light shaft. Was this your first collaboration? Or oh, no, you, we've no. been collaborating, okay. you know, since ancient times. Uh, <laughs> okay. Before we were born, it's obvious. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but no, actually, our first collaboration started about 72, 73. Mm -hmm. Okay. Again, this is another collaborative piece that we did, a uh, uh, revival piece. This was done at what I consider the best sculpture show in town, and that's the one that Barrera does up there on, on uh, uh, Vance Jackson. That's, this, is a, this is one of the pieces we did for them, and that's about 80 feet large, each one of those angel wings, uh, with sound built into the grass, so sound speakers in the And what grass. was the sound? What did we hear? Uh, it was a lot of uh, very l nice drones that were built upon the way trailer trucks sound real far away, mm, passing with a lot of Doppler shift and a lot of phase shift, just the simple sounds coming out of the earth. Uh, this is a piece at the Saw's uh, corporate boardroom. Uh, it's a, a sandblasted glass, and that with uh, uh, programmed LEDs and fluorescent lights around it, that's 80 by 68 inches. And again, uh, when you're dealing with glass, you're dealing with silica. Uh, you know, glass is just melted sand. And that's uh, three quarters inch thick. And uh, yeah, that's it. And it was called uh, Origin of the Blue Planet because that's H2O, uh, the molecules. Uh, uh -huh. All of those are, yeah. Yeah, that's the piece that was destroyed. Uh, it was at the Museo. Uh, Again, the long tradition of destroying murals in San Antonio seems to have taken place this week and again. <laughs> and Alex, let's fight it, man. And Lopez was a jerk to take your piece down. Uh, but it happened to Roland Rodriguez when they destroyed his mural at the convention center. And of course, my mural was destroyed. Uh, and tell us what was in the mural. This was a piece that was commissioned uh, uh, was, uh, for the Somos Gallery at the Museo. And it deals with uh, the content of who we are in San Antonio. This particular image has a lot of hands, and those are the hands of many of the workers who built and restored that museum. The, mm -hmm. the uh, staff, the drywall workers, the masons, the welders. Uh, we took pictures of their hands in this scene. Uh, it was uh, what they call ultra-wide video, 4,000 by uh, 700 pixels, and they needed three projectors to make one frame, and that was, that, that was that's a high-tech piece for it to be at this, been destroyed and, and discarded so flippantly. Uh, this is a video cloth piece again of Catherine I that uh, uh, was from Blue Star a couple of years ago, and uh, it was a kind of an extension of a piece I, we did I did in 1968 when uh, in the psychedelic period when I would put overhead projectors and slide projectors on swings, spin them around and stuff, and that's how we did light shows a lot, uh, very low tech. But this one here, we put the camera on the swing and did the overhead shot. So it was, it was a nice it was a nice piece. And thank you for, for including us in that, David. And I think our 12 minutes is almost over. Yes, yeah. uh, but and, we're almost okay. done. 
This is a piece that Catherine and I did in 2008 at the Woodlawn Lake Swimming Pool. And what we did is, um, it's, it's, a, it's, well, it's, a, it's not too washed. Uh, it's large pieces of, 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 of stretch cloth that fill the space. And then we were using sounds that were resonant to the dimensions of the space. And it created this really nice hum and this, this sound shower. Once you walked into the pool, it was, you would just bathe in sound and these beautiful cloth. It was a, it was a crystal clear day about maybe 34 degrees. It was just a, it was a really nice piece. Again, our stuff is ephemeral. It comes and goes. It's gone. OK. Thank, Thank you, you, George. Thank you. I appreciate it. Our next artist is James Cobb. James is self-taught. He has been exhibiting his paintings. Um, I'm sorry, he, he, he has been exhibiting his paintings since the 1980s. More recently, he has been um, making digital art. James has had solo exhibitions in New York, Los Angeles, Osaka, Japan, Houston, Dallas, San Antonio, and the Netherlands. He, he currently teaches at Our Lady of the Lake University in San Antonio. He is also an accomplished musician and has his own digital recording studio and has released two CDs. Why don't you welcome James Cobb. First, so, first I'd like yes. to say, how about that George Cisneros? He can remember dates, he can remember dimensions, <laughs> he can remember why the heck he did what he did. I'm really impressed, George. <laughs> <laughs> OK, let, let's talk about your work now, though. Um, so you st uh, this is one of your earlier paintings from 1989. Um, you want to tell us um, a little bit about the subject matter, where the imagery came from? Did you, did you set something up? Is it all from your head? Uh, it, it, traditionally, even when the imagery is looks like this one does like a traditional still life or so forth i don't usually set things up because even when i attempt to set things up they i change them entirely when i paint them and this was painted not too long after i really first began painting i had been painting about four or five years i think when i when i painted this and i was actually a lot of my education in terms of uh dealing with with painting is from books as opposed to dealing with the paintings face to face. And actually I've talked to other people about southwestern artists and, and a, a kind of tradition of maybe not living close enough to enough major institutions to have learned a lot about paintings, including surface, from coffee table books. And so uh, this is back in the 80s and I don't remember who I was talking to but they were theorizing that there was a, that there was a real kind of smooth surface to a lot of southwestern work hmm. because these artists had not been experiencing because they had seen paintings. the thick paint okay <laughs> yeah yeah but um why this subject why cantaloupes yeah or why ants well both <laughs> or why well why i've had, both, I've, why had a, I've had a long a lifetime <laughs> time thing with ants actually uh, they come and go in paintings o over the years uh, as a as as a kind of a kinetic element, as um, I've always loved the patterns they create and so forth, and to me they represent a little bit of chaos introduced to any any scene. Um, the the cantaloupes and so forth. I was just really exploring kind of traditional still life motifs. I always have at that at that point I would have probably four or five different series of works going over the course of, of any given year and there was always the still lives and then there was sort of the portraits and then there was sort of the narrative paintings. Well, we're, we're going to see some of the other examples but getting back to the ants, um, uh, what is it about them that, you know, I mean what made you decide to paint them? Well, I have I have some ant karma from my childhood <laughs> because we used to. Did you have to, some ex you know, particular experience? I, yeah, actually, I do. <laughs> when I was a kid, we lived for a while in suburban St. Louis, way out on the fringes near farm country, mm -hmm. in in suburban developments that our backyard was actually abutted fields and woods and so forth. And we used to jump the barbed wire fences, and go out into the woods. And my friends and I would discover these big, these old trees that had fallen over. 
and they would they were be rotting and decaying, and they ants. were infested with ants. And and we were both we were all raised on these black and white World War II movies with John Wayne and so forth, right? Mm -hmm. So we would get screwdrivers and crowbars, and we would pry open the wood, and the ants would swarm out. This, this is really bad. I don't feel good about this, okay? Then we'd take <laughs> hammers. Oh, no. And then we would smash the ants. And we would smash them until they covered the, the tree. And what they created, this, this is about the movies, they created battlefield scenes. And we thought that was really awesome, right? Well, I regret that a lot. <laughs> and, and, I've, and I've carried that around with me. And I think about it. So, so ants have been something I've dealt with on, on a couple levels. One is I've always loved seeing them swarm, and I love the right. patterns and so right. forth. But the other is I feel like I have this karmic debt, <laughs> and I have to keep revisiting Pay tribute ants. to the ants. Right. Okay, all right. Um, Ship of Fools, was this, uh, obviously it's a reference to the movie title? It is a reference to the movie title, and to be honest with you, I like the concept of Ship of Fools without actually knowing much about the film. I don't think I had even seen the film when I painted that, but it's a little bit like the um, uh, Fire Sign Theater. I think it, we we're all bozos on this bus, same sort of concept, mm -hmm. right? So it's kind of like life's journey from a certain perspective? From a certain <laughs> perspective. Yeah. And I think it's a little bit more about people's struggle with being people essentially. And getting along? Getting along. Were you thinking of the movie, movie, movie Lifeboat as well? Lifeboat, yeah, actually. Hitchcock? Sure, yeah, yeah definitely. Okay. So um, this is where an artist's ideas come from. Now, how about St. John, or, or I should say John the Baptist, as you call it. Uh, and where does this figural style come from also? <clears throat> Were you looking at Francis Bacon at all? In books? I do like Francis Bacon, <laughs> but uh, I, I, in books, yeah. I, I did finally, at, at some point in the 80s, I went to Houston and saw uh, one of his images at the DeMille. Okay. Prior to that, I really had it just right. been books. Yeah, I, I, I don't think I was particularly influenced by, by Bacon in terms of, of my own approach to figures. People have brought that up, and, and I recognize the similarity. <clears throat> Although I think Bacon was coming from kind of a, maybe a, uh, pessimistic, nihilistic kind of place. I always felt like I was coming from exactly the opposite place, where I felt like I was uh, uh, even celebratory in a strange way. All right, so uh, why, call, why is this painting called John the Baptist, and is it I celebratory? Did, I did a, a series of, of biblically-based biblically uh, paintings, probably 25 or 30 fairly large-scale paintings, uh, for a couple of reasons. One is I wanted to be part of that great tradition of painting these themes and these stories and these narratives. Mm -hmm. And the other was that in my personal life, I was also exploring these same themes and narratives. Uh, and what, what was the other question? Is it celebratory? Yeah, yeah I think it is, sure. And it's, and it's John the Baptist as, uh, if, um, imagine if you will that you're on your way to Marfa and you're on I-10 someplace just this side of Fort Stockton and you look up and you catch a glimpse of a guy standing on the side of the road eating a locust, right? I mean, that's my John the Baptist wandering the wilderness. Okay. Was <laughs> a miracle on the way to Marfa. Yeah, right. Okay, this painting, of course, we all know because it's in the Sama collection and it's currently hanging on the second floor. Um, Perishables too. The ants have returned. The ants have returned. Yeah, they always did. I would do every year. I would three or four paintings would would feature yeah, swarms of ants. We've talked about this painting before. Do you remember what you said about it? <laughs> not specifically. Not to, I'm not George. All right. <laughs> Well, I mean, um, something about beauty, you know, you had, you, you really, you talked about um, the beauty in, ge in life in general, uh, about seduction and this fine line. I mean, now I'm speaking for you, but. You yeah, know. yeah. Well, in general, in, in, in the paintings, what I really liked to attempt was to imbue the paintings with, with an edge that would <clears throat> may become perilously close to repelling the viewer, but at the same time imbue it with enough beauty to seduce them into spending time with it or, or actually 
feeling good about it or liking it or enjoying it. Well, I mean, that's a or, kind of aesthetic tension that is what a lot of great art does. It, it, it puts you on the cusp of something. Well, and it's an aesthetic tension that I, I like, I live by the river, and when we take walks, Rhoda and I take walks down by the river, I can't look at anything in nature without seeing that aesthetic tension. Mm -hmm. the, the, the trunks of the crepe myrtles are, are beautiful yet intertwined and edgy, and, and there's all this tension going on. Mm -hmm. In fact, all of nature strikes me that way. Mm -hmm. Herons and dead fish. I actually painted this after coming back from San Ignacio and staying with, uh, God, who's the artist down there? No. The, well, Eric. Eric Avery, sure. I stayed with Eric. This is uh, 20 years ago, right? And he was, we went down to the river, the Rio Grande, and he was talking about the pollution coming down from Laredo and the amounts mm. of dead mm. fish mm. that were floating on the river. Uh, and so I came back and I was, I had been this thinking about that. This was your response to that yeah. conversation? Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> I did, I did a, a couple of large scale paintings of Gandhi based on drawings that my son did in grade school. There was a jump start after school art program at Bonham Elementary where he went to school. And one of his assignments was to draw pictures of a hero. He was supposed to pick a hero. So he picked Gandhi, and he was really just assigned to draw a picture of Gandhi, but Forrest took it way over the top and did about 20 images of Gandhi. It started pretty tamely sitting, and then pretty soon it was playing tag with his son, then it was pretty soon it was Gandhi in a helicopter, and Gandhi <laughs> swimming, and Gandhi at the party, and, God, and they were really fantastic. So what's Gandhi doing here? He's Gandhi's seated. just sitting, and yes. really, I did, I did a couple I did a couple of paintings that were really rip-offs of his work. I attempted to keep the, did he the do absolute one childlike. Or, yes, yeah, he did yeah. that. Now, it, it, it's more detailed, and the color, I've right. taken a lot of liberties with it. Well, you've but the pose, it. that's his pose. That's Gandhi, the legs So it's honoring out Gandhi and, and your son at the same time? At the same time, yeah. <laughs> Uh, well, this painting I remember because I showed it in the Phoenix Triennial in 1998, your catfish head series. Um, I remember, but you tell everyone what that's about. Well, not too long after we first moved to Texas, we were driving around and I saw for the first time uh, a fence row with catfish heads. I think this was in Seguin. And I really, that image really stuck with me. And years later, I went out to Seguin to see if I could find it again because I thought I wanted to document it and, and then maybe paint some pictures. And it was gone, but somebody knew I was looking and they sent me out to Castroville and I found another row, sort of the poor man's trophy case, right, barbed wire fence where there's a catfish head every, for 20 or 30 fence posts, big gnarly ones. And uh, so I photographed them and it, I did a series, I think 20, I'm thinking there were 10 to 20 paintings, I can't remember. And why do I'm they have sure. tattoo imagery on them? At that point, I was really beginning to enjoy working with imagery, uh, tattoo-like imagery, as a means of supplying another kind of stream of consciousness. Like a second Word narrative. association, a second layer of information to just allow the viewer to try to figure that one out, essentially. Were you able to figure it out yourself? Oh, I never do, or maybe I always do. Or yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's on the cusp again, yeah, uh, okay. Um, and then at the same time, you painted this uh, sort of fictional uh, self-portrait with your family. Mm -hmm. These, this was taken from photographs of us on, we used to spend summers in Ruidoso. Not all summer, of course, just a week or two. Every summer we'd take the kids up there. And this was shot in a hotel in Roswell, I think. Pretty straightforward, except for the tattoos, I, I suppose. <laughs> Carrying the big beam. This was part of a series of, of pieces I did inspired by a poem by Jimmy Santiago Baca. I heard him read at the Guadalupe Theater, I'm thinking 15, 20 years ago now. And he read a, a long poem, and part of his poem was about himself. He felt himself morphing. He felt himself morphing into a, like metal and beams and becoming a, this bridge. And it, 
I thought the imagery was so fantastic that I did a number of fairly large scale paintings featuring bridge work like beams and so forth. And then this painting was actually, uh, I started to feel like I wanted to paint some of the process of the bridge work being built actually. These were, these were guys, uh, it, it didn't get much further than this, but in my mind I, I had imagined that I was going to have the, the whole process of, of construction where these guys would be bringing these beams to this big central piece, essentially that actually never happened. Banana tree roots and the ants are back. Banana tree roots with ants. This was a result really of a photograph I took of, I exhumed my banana trees because some years ago uh, we were entering a drought and they took too much water. I had lots of really beautiful banana trees in front of my house, but I had to really water them every other day to keep them alive. And I thought, ah, I don't, I don't really need to be doing this. So I, I pulled them out of the ground and I just laid them on a plywood plank and they sat there for a long time. And then I got to looking at them and they were just really fascinating to me. It's actually roots in general, root forms, tree trunks, that kind of thing. So I took a picture of it and uh, really this painting is a result of that. So this one you actually did Take, uh, set up something up and take Yes, a and actually I was fairly faithful to it. Some liberties with color and... Other than the ants. Other than the ants. Yeah. And then uh, in the, by the turn of the millennium, you had found a new medium, digital technology. What, what motivated you to sort of take down the paintbrush and pick up the mouse? Well, initially it was, it was because I felt like I needed to augment my income, and so I thought maybe I needed to return to doing some graphic work for hire. Uh -huh. And the whole world had changed since since I had been doing that 20 years prior, cut and paste and that kind of thing. So I knew I knew I needed to, to be digital, to be for that to be feasible at all. Uh, but I rarely did any commercial work at all because I got the computer and I got really seduced by that as a medium. Um, and and, and, and these, for this series, yeah, this is this a, particular yeah. series. I got a scanner. And I was thrilled that suddenly I was able to work with photographic-like imagery without having to have a camera or knowing anything about f-stops and lighting and exposure and all that stuff. And I also liked the built-in limitations to the scanner. Anything that's not pressed right against the glass, it's a quarter inch away or half inch away is gone. There's no depth of field. So uh, this occurred to me, this series occurred to me I really liked the, the fact that you could only really lay on the scanner with your front to it or with your back to it. There weren't really any other options. Mm -hmm. So I liked the, all the limitations I had to work with. And, and, and I liked the, the, uh, the fact that when the bodies are laying on the glass, you can see the skin's pressed and, and so forth. Flattens it out, of course. It flattens it and out. And then, of course, you, you brought an element from your paintings into these with the tattoo image and the, the light. Yeah, it was really fun to work with the, with the children who have that kind of clean slate innocence. You know, the, the world is waiting. And then to load them down with kind of acculturation as though this, this, is, your, this is a possible future. This is what's out there. This is, you mm -hmm. know, it was really fun to kind of fill them up with that. And Wheel of Delusion, which is on view in Psychedelic. This is at the tail end of a series of images I did that were the most abstract visual work that I've done. And it was inspired by a period where I had almost completely stopped doing visual work and was just doing music. And the approach I took to music making was, I felt a lot different than the approach I took to making visuals. And I wanted to take that music, the approach I was, I was creating musically, I wanted to take that into the visuals. Um, if you think about figurative work as maybe being uh, musically, maybe being something that's melodic or has structure, the music I was working with had, was more atonal and dissonant and, and dynamic than that, and that's how I wanted to do